Greetings. This is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central here in Kent, Ohio. Yes, we've had to kind of turn things around a little bit here because, um, you know, the winds of change have just been blowing right on through here and tossing us like a boat set adrift with no anchor. But I have to, I have to let you know, we do have an anchor. And it has nothing to do with a big piece of metal down in the water. That's right. Our anchor is up on high. And we are coming black at you with what should have been our first segment today. Second. So don't let that turn you all around. We just are trying to keep up because we hate to fall behind. And we're going to go. We're going to return. We're going to go black a little bit here in time and um, read some more from the book, The Fences Between by Norma Marceray. Norma Marceray. And let's see if I can find where we were because I don't have my marker where it was earlier, because we actually did this earlier, but you just couldn't see it. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Um, yeah, I think we'll start right about here. So some of this I may have read yesterday, may not. But we're going to go over it again, and we'll read a little bit further. So we'll get a little bit further up the road. And in the meanwhile, you know what we need you to do. If you're watching us on Facebook, give us a like. If you're watching us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. And then go ahead and... <laughs> then go ahead and... Um... Spread the word far and wide about the pride that Black Facts is bringing to black life everywhere. Not just in America, but worldwide. All right. And in the meanwhile, it looks like we've got some fixing to do over here. Uh, we've got a few little issues again. This thing, I don't know what's been going on with this stuff here, but man, this has been giving me, I've had problems all day long. Every time I go to do something, I got some kind of issue that comes up. And I don't understand why all these things are happening now when everything had been working so smooth up until now. So let's see. What do I have to do to fix this? Let's try doing this. There. Okay. There we go. Now. Okay. Now we got the right slideshow. And let's see if we can show it to you. All right. Boom. Shaka laka. Now let's see if that works right tonight. Hopefully it will. All right. And meanwhile, Let's go ahead and begin to do our reading from the book, The Fences Between. The chapter is called New Beginnings. Um, oh, here it is here. Yeah, here it is here. On the evenings... The restaurant closed early. I rather surreptitiously encouraged Percy to walk a, a route that covered every inch of Cherry Avenue from 9th Street South to 13th Street and from 9th Street North to East Tuscaroras Street and the public square. I was eager to satisfy my curiosity about this forbidden section of town. Fearing no danger, I was beginning to thoroughly enjoy 
those extended jaunts, properly escorted down mysteriously evil streets. My walking companion was a gentleman of the highest order. Oh, wait a minute. Did I not start this? Jeez, Louise. Okay. Looks like I hadn't started that. Okay, now it's going. Wow. I'll, I'll repeat this here. On the evenings, the restaurant closed early. I rather surreptitiously encouraged Percy to walk a route that covered every inch of Cherry Avenue from 9th Street South to 13th Street and from 9th Street North to East Tuscarora Street and the public square. I was eager to satisfy my curiosity about this forbidden section of town, fearing no danger. I was beginning to thoroughly enjoy those extended jaunts, properly escorted down mysteriously evil streets. My walking companion was a gentleman of the highest order and so entertaining. He was as different from my father as day is from night. My pop's reticence had prevented him from speaking a single word on our one mile walk to my high school and to his hotel job. Percy and I, on the other hand, we communicated quite nicely. All about us were the noisy, discordant sounds of many languages, but my interest in language and ethnic differences began long before the multiple babblings on Cherry Avenue. There were Germans speaking Slovaks who attended St. Mary's School, and my grandfather spoke German fluently. We had Romanian, Italian, and Jewish neighbors living next door to us. From whispered conversations at home, I gathered that quite a few Negroes had ambivalent feelings about foreigners. They often felt threatened, displaced, and excluded in the land that had been their forefather's home for 300 years. Negroes had no foreign allegiance. They had no second or third language. They were just English-speaking, brown-skinned Americans. My maternal grandparents, James Robert Evans and Cleela Dorsey Evans, were born free in 1841 and 1851, respectively. They claimed Pennsylvania and Bellevue, Ohio as home. My mother, Ida Evans, was married to Norman Sherwood Snipes from Raleigh, North Carolina in 1906. They witnessed the heavy tide of immigrants who came to Canton in 1909. They often found themselves in the midst of strange speaking peoples. The Jews had a synagogue in Canton as early as 1869. The Italians arrived in 1884, only to learn the Swiss were here in 1883. With the 1900 wave of immigrants, Canton, like many industrial Midwestern cities, had all the ingredients for an international melting pot. There was a carnival atmosphere about the sights, sounds, and smells of Cherry Avenue that vanished in the 60s with the clearing out of the slums, the construction of a superhighway, and the building of an industrial complex. The new skyline erased forever a whole area that surrounded the heart of the city like an alien squatter's village. I was curiously fascinated by the business places we passed, partly because my father had owned a billiard parlor on the corner of 3rd and Walnut Avenue Southeast, and my grandfather had had his own barbershop in Bellevue, Ohio. It was exciting to observe the array of multi-ethnic entrepreneurs excitedly serving the needs of their culturally different constituents. Many of the businesses evidenced their owners' ethnicity by their wares and their services. Their collection of talents and skills undoubtedly contributed to Canton's reputation as the city of diversified industry. Throughout the business day, 
these proprietors served their patrons gratefully, displaying the highest art of salesmanship and persuasion. Mobility and prosperity made it possible for these proprietors to move westward and northeastward away from their humble beginnings. Their second businesses sought the patronage of a white collar upper class clientele instead of their former blue collar supporters. They established lodges, golf courses, churches, hotels, and restaurants from which others, unlike themselves, were excluded. Negroes, in particular, were denied membership and entry. Such discriminatory practices were defended on the grounds that certain gatherings, private if you please, were for the furtherance of their own ethnic traditions. They needed to sustain their old world values while, became, while becoming Americanized. Negroes had no such link with their ancient traditions. After 300 years of agricultural servitude, after a complete divestiture of their African culture, family, language, tribal customs, and religion, Negroes were less than 65 years into the process of restructuring a Negro American culture. Percy and I engaged in deep philosophical prognostications about our people and the world in which we lived. We felt a sense of pride that in 1929, we had many community service businesses up and down Cherry Avenue. There were three restaurants, a pharmacy, three physicians, two dentists, two barbershops, a beauty parlor, three pool halls, a gasoline station, two garage repair shops, an undertaking establishment, a grocery store, a bakery, a dance hall, and a lodge, and my aunt's dry cleaning and pressing shop. Outside the multi-ethnic thoroughfare, there was the Gillespie Radio Repair Shop on 6th and Cleveland Northwest and Jackson's Fruit and Vegetable Produce Stand in the Auditorium Market. It was whispered that a popular downtown business was run by a Negro who was passing as white. We expressed, expressed confidence, much as my father had in 1904, that in America, the opportunity to do and to become was beckoning with open arms. Percy and I talked a lot about ourselves. We spoke of our likes and dislikes, our sisters and brothers, our hometown, and of our hopes for the future. Each of us was the oldest of a family of six children. He had four sisters and a brother, which paralleled my family of four girls and two boys. He was six years my senior, and we both had October birthdays. He was born in Meridian, Mississippi. His father was a Baptist preacher. Percy, on his way to New York, stopped to visit a childhood friend of his, Dr. Simon Cole, a dentist. Dr. Cole advised him to remain in Canton, saying it was a good place to earn money and to save it. Percy was supporting his sister, Alberdeen, at Columbia University. She was in nurse training. He had dated no one since his arrival in Canton in 1924 and declared he never planned to marry, and neither did I. Occasionally, during my senior year, as I passed the square on my way to high school, I had heard a man whistling a block away on East Tuscaroras and Piedmont with a resonance of unique quality, the tunes of My Blue Heaven or Let Me Call You Sweetheart or maybe Ain't Misbehaving and other popular ballads of the day caught the attention of scores of people headed for work. Often, I wondered who was the person of such happiness, joyfully rendering such beautiful music. Now, I knew. Percy was the whistling porter custodian at the Richmond Brothers Men's Clothing Store. At 7.30 a.m., he could be seen washing the display windows and mopping the foyer. When the opportunity arose, I would stop outside Richmond's for a chat while he went about his work. Kent State University had just opened 
a one-year normal school extension unit at the Canton City School Admin Building. Simultaneously, Mrs. John Leonard offered me a job as a live-in maid and cook with time off to go to school. My pay was $10 a week with the $50 Menelik Culture Club scholarship and nearly half the salary I had saved for my two summer jobs I was able to enroll in college. I was also able to give mom half of my salary, $20 a month. And that's where we're going to end up, right about there. Perfect timing. I was 10 seconds shy. So now we've got that in the can. And we're all ready to go because we just really want to make sure that we read as much from this particular book here as possible because it's all about a black homecoming. That's right, a black homecoming. And for many of us, home is more of a spiritual place than it is a physical place. But in this case, we are talking about a spiritual homecoming, but we're also talking about a physical homecoming to a place we know as Kent. Kent, Ohio, Kent State University, and we just celebrated homecoming a couple days ago. So for this whole month, in honor of homecoming and uh, this homecoming celebration that we just celebrated, we're going to deal with the history of black people in this area as told by one Norma Marcia Ray, because she gives us a pretty good view of what it was like to be black in this part of Northeast Ohio back in the early part of the 20th century, back in the 1920s and 30s and on up into the 21st century. She only died a few years ago. So Norma Marcia Ray, really good story. And I hope you're enjoying the read. We'll be doing this. We'll be reading from this book every day at noon, like we did today, but hopefully with a lot less technical difficulties. And hopefully Facebook can actually keep stay on the air. But at least if they're not on the um, on the internet, at least we'll understand why. And we won't be sitting here trying to take our phone apart. Because I was seriously about to take my phone apart trying to figure out what the problem was. Because I just knew it was an individual thing. I just knew Facebook had not gone down. But today, uh, it hasn't shut down, I think they said, since 2008. This is the first time uh, Facebook has not been uh, accessible to people from all over the planet. Or, matter of fact, WhatsApp also went down, and so did Instagram. All three of them went down today, and it was it, it has something to do with the whistleblower at Facebook. You can check that on your daily news. Meanwhile, we're going to stop giving you so many blues, and we're going to go ahead and move on. You know what we need you to do so we can stay strong. We need y'all to give us a like if you're watching on Facebook, a thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube, and then go ahead because it's that time of the month and make a small donation so we can continue to do what we're doing here as a vocation as opposed to a vacation. If you can appreciate what we're saying, go ahead and make your donation. There's a link. You'll find it on your phone. Uh, go into your notifications. Hit that. You'll find a notification over there. You can do it on Facebook. If you can't do it on Facebook, go to YouTube right below the description. You'll find a link there. If you can't find us at either one of those places, go to our website. We got a link at the top of the page that says donations. Hit that link and drop us a dime for real. Appreciate it. In the meanwhile, we'll be black tomorrow with more from The Fences Between by Norma Marceray and Tomorrow evening, we'll be black with more of our scary stories about haints, all them green haints. So be here, unless you just have too much fear. Peace out, y'all. Have a good night.